Hey guys, my name is Francisco Hernandez, and today I'm going to be breaking down this image here on the screen of Zadie from my most recent photo walk at the WPPI photo conference in Vegas. One thing I want to do really quickly is give a huge shout out to Cheetah Stand for providing the modifiers and the light stands that I used while I was over there attending WPPI. It really made my travel much, much more convenient because I didn't have to bring any of my own modifiers or stands. And the guys behind the company are really awesome as well. So again, huge shout out to Cheetah Stand. I actually really did enjoy the products and going forward in future photo shoots, I might use their stuff a lot more often. If you guys are interested in Cheetah Stand products, I'll leave links to them in the description area below. The stuff that I used for this photo shoot and other stuff that I tried out, but not at this specific photo shoot. So you guys can check out those links in the description below. Of course, I do also wanna give a huge shout out to the model, Zadie. She is an awesome model. I've worked with her before and she was great then and she was great at the photo that we did. So huge shout out to Zadie. I'll leave a link to her Instagram at the bottom of the screen as well as in the description area below. So now back to the image that we're gonna be talking about today, this image on the screen right here of Zadie. I did wanna break down the light that I use, the lens that I use and the camera that I use just so you guys know everything, you know, all the detail about the gear because I actually did have good reasons for each of those different things. Probably the least important is the camera that I used because it's just one that I always use. I'm a fan of the a7R 3 because of the megapixels that it has, 42. The fact that it can handle high ISOs really well. And it's a Sony camera that's full frame. So that's pretty much why I use that camera. But the lens is something that I never really use, which is the Tamron 35 to 150. It's a zoom lens that has an aperture from f2 to f2.8. I wanted to use that lens because even though I typically do use prime lenses uh, for the wide apertures, sometimes I miss out on different focal lengths. I have my 35 and my 105, and I do really like those two lenses, but sometimes I feel like I want to have, you know, a 100, I want 80 millimeters, different things like that. And because that lens has a good range and it has a good aperture as well, it's something I might, you know, going forward, use more often. And it actually performed really well at the photo shoot. It was very sharp. At, you know full resolution I'll show you guys that in a second but that's why I use that camera and that lens when it comes to the lighting I use the Explorer 300 Pro as the main light also known as the Godox 8300 Pro and for the rim light I use the Evolve 200 Pro also known as the Godox 8200 Pro the main light the 300 had a Cheetah Stand QSB 34 which is their 34 inch beauty dish I actually used the deflector plate on that with two diffusion panels, so it was really nice soft light. The 200 that I used as the rim light didn't have a modifier, but I did use it bare with a certain attachment. I used the round head attachment right here, and there was actually a good reason for using this round head attachment. It actually provides a nice bright modeling lamp, and I knew that because I was doing these different photo walks towards the late evening, towards into the night, that I was gonna make use of the modeling lamp feature on both my 300 and my 200. And this round head attachment has a brighter lamp than the included Fresnel head shape thing for the 200. This is very weak modeling lamp, so I wanted to use the brighter round head attachments modeling lamp. Whenever I do any sort of night photo shoot, I always try to use a strobe or a flash that has a lamp feature because it's gonna be easier to focus and you get more color in the eye. So that's why I specifically used the 200 with the round head and the 300 Pro because it does have a nice bicolor LED lamp as well. The last piece of gear that I wanted to mention is one that will save your 200 in case it falls. And it's gonna be this guy right here. The off-camera flashback is what it's called. I'll leave a link to it in the description below because I highly recommend this. I actually used this for my own 200 Pro this past December at my niece's quinceanera and it saved my light. It saved my 200 because a little kid kicked this over and it fell and this absorbed a lot of the fall damage, the shock. So I highly recommend it. Again, link in the description. It will save you 200 in case it falls. But now that you guys know why I use that camera, that lens, those lights, those modifiers, all of those different things. Now let's actually go into Lightroom and show you guys the straight out of camera, unedited photos and how I progressed to ultimately get to that final shot that I really did like. With this very first shot that I took of Zadie, it's not ideal at all. She's not posing or anything. I only took this image so that you guys can see at the exact same settings that I have for this image, which is ISO 800, 1 100 of a second, f2.0 at 35 millimeters. You can see at those exact settings, which are gonna be the same throughout the entire set of images that I'm gonna be showing you today, 
you can see how different this image looks like without the light on and then how different it looks like with the light on. I actually chose those exact settings for a good reason. I wanted to keep the detail in the shadows while also not overexposing these lights behind her in the bush area because if I were to go ahead and just adjust my settings to be brighter in the ambient, you know, either slowing down my shutter or raising my ISO, then I would get more detail in this area behind her if I wanted that, but I would also be overexposing these lights behind her and I wanted to recover the detail. So that's why I chose those exact settings. One thing that's really important to this image that I want you guys to take notice of is how much ambient light is actually hitting the background behind her. We were shooting basically at the end of blue hour, so the light is fading quickly every second. So even though this first image at the exact same settings are, you know, it looks like this with a good amount of ambient, towards the end when I took that final image I really did like, you can see that there's way less ambient light behind her and that's because Again, you're losing light every single second, so you do have to work quick or adjust your settings whenever you're working at a time period like golden hour or blue hour when the light is fading every second. So back to this very first image, you can see that Zadie is not lit at all. The ambient light is actually not that flattering in my opinion. There's shadows in her eyes and stuff. So next image, the modeling lamp features are now on. No flashes firing yet. You can definitely see that she's still not exposed correctly. There was actually room to increase the output of the both modeling lamps, the 300 and the 200. And that's actually what we ended up doing later on. But I think somebody at the photo lock had a flash and they wanted to know more about how to use that flash. So even though I did ideally want to use the modeling lamps only, for the sake of that one person and everybody else learning at the photo lock, I wanted to really just fire the flash and show what was capable with the flash and then later on kind of show the the benefits of the modeling lamps. From this image to the next image now the light is now firing and one thing I took notice of when I took this image is that she was overexposed a tiny bit in my opinion. I was now shooting in TTL because at the lowest output of both the 200 and the 300 at 1 256, which is the lowest output on both those lights, it was too strong. I wish I had taken a picture so you guys can see exactly you know, how strong it was. So I ended up going into TTL. And if you guys didn't know this yet, whenever you go into TTL, you actually achieve lower outputs than the lowest available manual output on your flash. For example, on both of my lights, the lowest output is 1 256 but in TTL, you can go even lower. With this photo right here, I was at TTL zero, you know, the baseline TTL. And in this next shot here, I was now at TTL minus one, and that gave me a good exposure. So now that TTL minus one gave me a good exposure on Zadie, I now need to think, okay, what else do I need to do to fix the shot and make it better? And one easy answer to that is removing my rim light, my 200 Pro, that's literally in the shot. I need to remove it so that it's no longer in my shot. So that's exactly what I did from this shot to the next shot. But for every single shot that I'm taking, every single shot, I'm thinking, okay, what needs to be fixed? What needs to be better? And I kind of aim, you know, step by step. I try to figure out those different things that I can do to make it better. So that's exactly what I'm going to be breaking down for all these different shots. Even though I do like this shot as is, I then had the idea. I actually originally had the idea to have her kind of bathe in the light. So that's actually what my next goal was to kind of get a good image with that with that kind of style in mind, that pose. So from this image to the next image, you can actually see that's exactly what we did. I did feel like it was a nice shot, but I do feel like her neck and her face are two in the same position. So it kind of looks like it's just a long elongated neck, if that makes any sense. I feel like it's too stiff of a neck kind of appearance. Usually whenever I take any sort of like closed eye, really emotion kind of shot. I want the face to be kind of a little bit turned away from the neck so that the face hits or is getting more light than the neck. And right now it feels like the neck, shoulder and the face are kind of getting the same amount of light. From this photo to this next one, that's when I decided to give her just a little bit of direction and told her to face towards the light a little bit, you know, to get that little bit of a turn. But one mistake that I made was I took a step back and got a little bit of a higher angle and that actually made her look a little bit smaller when comparing this previous shot to this shot. She looks a little bit smaller. When I took this photo, I did kind of like it, 
but I felt like I wanted a really nice dramatic angle. I wanted that drama. There's a lot of shadows here. It's It just screams drama, this shot. So I wanted to get a dramatic angle to kind of match the vibes of the shot. So from this photo to this next one, I did get that nice dramatic angle a little bit lower, but I then discovered some more errors. Even though I was a big fan of this new angle, this new composition, and even though the pose is very similar, you can actually see that the pose is almost exactly the same, except for her arm is a little bit more extended so that there's more space between her and the lamp post. One thing that I was seeing is I still didn't fix that that uh, that mistake with the neck being in the same position as the face. It's only slightly turned towards the light. But another error that I saw was the shadow underneath the chin right here, I felt like it was too apparent, it was too thick, and I wanted to slim down that shadow. So I would either need to ask her to kind of lower her chin a little bit or change my angle. Even though I like exactly how the frame is here where you know this light is not going into her arm, I had that idea in mind to kind of slim down the shadow underneath her chin. So from this photo to the next one, you can see that that shadow is a little bit slimmer underneath her chin, but that's because I went at a higher angle. Instead of asking her to lower her chin a little bit, I changed my angle, but that did ruin the nice composition that I had before that I liked better. So you can see that the, the light behind her is now going into her arm rather than before. I felt like it was nice in line with this tree branch right here. It was very parallel, if that makes sense. So I did like this composition better, and even though I did correct this, the little bit of the um, chin shadow, it was a worse composition in my, head, in my opinion. So with that in mind, wanting to fix the composition, I tried to do two things at once. I told her to turn a little bit towards the light so that I would fix that that mistake that I had in mind where I didn't want the head and the face or the head and the neck to be in the same position. I asked her to turn towards the light and then also fix that composition as before right here and that gave me this result. So now with this next image, I do have the composition better. I asked her to turn a little bit towards the light and it gave me a better angle, well, not ideal, but a better angle. But I actually really did like this image. But at this point, I realized I took so many images of her with her eyes closed you know, she has a good expression in her face. She really does well with the expressions. Let's have her open her eyes and actually look towards the camera and see what we can create with that. So from this image here, I was actually kind of happy with. I asked her to then look towards the camera and that actually corrected the mistake that I had previously where I felt like the neck was getting too much light. So from here, and here, you can see from here that her shoulder, her neck, and her face are very similar exposures. From this next photo here, the neck has now more shadow and I feel like it's now lo no longer competing for attention in regards to the face. And I always want the face to be the center of attention because that's what, in my opinion, makes a good portrait. Now at this point, Again, it's always figuring out what can be better about the shot. I liked so many things about this shot except for one thing that's very obvious to me now, which is her hair. I felt like her hair is all over the place and I wanted to just push it back. So that's exactly what I did for this next shot. I asked her to push her hair back. You know, I had already taken a shot with her looking forward. So I was like, you know, it looks nice, but I want where she's looking somewhere else. So I asked her to turn away towards the light and that, that's what gave me this photo here. Hair is no longer in the way. It's a different look. I like the composition, everything looks great. So now at this point, I can just nail down the different things like pose and expression. I felt like this shot was an awesome shot, but I thought, you know what? Let's try to get some movement. I don't really get movement a lot in my photos. So let's have the dress a little bit flowy. I had my fiance, Ashley, get a little bit of the dress at the end and then just throw it just a little bit. And that's what created this shot here. What I didn't intend to do, which was something that was awesome, was that Zadie gave me more of a bend in her knee or her leg, and that made the shot even even more dramatic and I really liked it. Angles really, really do help a shot. So her better pose and a little bit of flow in the dress ended up working really great, but it wasn't exactly how I wanted the dress to look. I wanted more of a nice flow to it. So <laughs> unfortunately for this next shot, I didn't time it right and the dress kind of just fell down. So that was a fail. But finally, with this next shot here, it was exactly how I wanted it. There was a nice flow. The light was hitting it. It was making a nice dimension in the dress. The pose was great. Her expression is great. The angle of her face was good. On my list of things that I like in a good photo, all those different things were checked for this photo and I was ultimately happy with it and that's why I edited this shot. One thing that ended up being great, happy accident, was you can actually see right here in the previous shot is that light right there, that little bit of an ISO or bright light. When the dress got up, it actually perfectly covered it. So that was a nice happy accident. The version of the image that you're seeing on the screen is completely unedited. This image right here, this is actually the original Lightroom edit that I did to it, but I thought it would be better if I just broke down exactly the major things that I did to this photo by 
editing it with you with this other copy that's unedited. So I'm gonna do that right now. Now in the develop module, now we can start editing. And one of the biggest things that I did to this image was increase the ambient light behind her. Like I mentioned before, I had it at ISO 800 because it did give me a little bit of ambient behind her and it didn't overexpose those lights behind her as well. So it was a good balance there. So now that I have the image exactly how I wanted it and the exposure exactly where there's like leverage to kind of manipulate it. So now I'm gonna go ahead and go to this right here, masking, shift or command W. And now I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna select the background. And now that the background is selected, now I'm gonna go ahead and just raise the shadows quite a bit. And I feel like even at, even, okay, 100, it does a great job, but I also wanna raise the exposure just a little bit at 0.15. And I feel like there's, now there's a good amount of detail behind her compared to before. So again, this is the before and then this is the after. I just wanted that little bit of extra detail in the shadows. When I hit the keyboard shortcut K, now I have an adjustment brush and I always use this brush to kind of do different things like reducing the highlights of the lamps behind her. So right now I'm just painting the, you know, the area that I want to fix and now I can see exactly what I painted over. And now I'm gonna go ahead and just reduce the highlights quite a bit to like negative 40. And then now I have a nicer even exposure on the highlights and nothing that's too bright. So it's not too distracting. Another thing that I usually do is give a little bit of a glow towards the subject. So I always paint just very quickly over the subject areas that I want to just be a little bit brighter. And then I go ahead and just slightly raise the exposure little by little. And I think at this point, at 0.8, it looks good. It's not too bright. Basically, it's just giving her a little bit of pop. But now let's just show you how I increase the colors. It's always on the bottom of the develop module. The blue saturation slider, I'm gonna go to 100. The blues and the oranges always go too far. So I'm gonna go ahead and reduce those. Well, after sharpening the image a little bit. And then now I'm gonna go ahead and go to the HSL section and reduce the saturation of orange to negative 15. And then the blues probably even further at negative 40. Yeah, negative 40, actually the negative 20 on the, there you go, on the orange. And now everything looks nice and saturated. And now I can pretty much take this image into Photoshop. There is gonna be a different version because it's gonna be this version right here. There's gonna be this version that I originally had in Lightroom in Photoshop, so keep that in mind. In Photoshop with this image, for every image I do actually, I always do a little bit of frequency separation, dodge and burn, and distraction removal. So, and also have a little bit of fun with the colors as well. So I'm gonna just break down the different layers and show you guys exactly what it did, and then we'll be done. The very first thing I did was frequency separation to kind of smoothen the skin and reduce wrinkles in the outfit. You can see before, after. Then I removed that little bit of softbox using the clone snap tool. Then I did a little bit of dodge and burn. I'll zoom in just a little bit right there. And then before, after, before, after. <laughs> this next layer is called left eye because if you zoom in, you can see that the left eye is a little bit dark. So I went ahead and just copied this right eye and pasted it over the left. So that's what you see that from there to that. That's just copying and pasting the eye. Then I actually did a little bit of selective color. The selective color adjustment layer is what I always do to adjust colors. For this specific edit, I felt like when I adjusted the, the whites, I felt like it gave a little bit of shine and depth to the skin. So I'm gonna show you guys exactly what I mean. So pay attention to these highlights in the skin. This is gonna be the before, and this is gonna be the after. When I had it before, I felt like the skin was more muted, but when I adjusted those whites, I felt like it gave it that shine and depth and more dimension to the skin. So that's why, you know, I really liked that. So that's why I kept it like that. And the very next thing I did was I was looking again for anything that I do, I always like, how can I make this image better? So I did think that the leg color was a little bit uh, not as saturated. It felt more pale than the rest of the skin. So I increased the saturation of the legs and I also added saturation to not just the legs, but the hands and the arms where I felt like it was not as saturated. Then I uh, matched the skin tone. So let's go ahead and zoom in on her skin and show you exactly what I mean. So pay attention to this shoulder here. If I take it off, you can see that there's kind of like this yellowish greenish tone around her shoulder. So basically what I did is I added a blank layer, sampled some of the skin using the eyedropper tool, eye, uh, next to it where I felt like I wanted it to kind of match up. And then I just painted it over that area where I felt like it was off color in the skin and then change the blending mode to color. And then you, if you feel like it's too different of a skin tone, then you can reduce the opacity to your liking, but that's exactly what I did. Now I just removed some blemishes off of the skin, like little wrinkles or little veins that were felt like too prominent. Then I did a little bit of global dodge and burn before, after, 
I did a little bit of dodge and burn on her face before, after. And also her nose a little bit towards the tip was a little bit cold, so it was a little bit darker. So I just fixed that, that tone in the skin on the nose. I removed a lot of distractions. You can see before and after. I definitely, you know, whenever I feel like the the subject has very kind of, you know, messy hair in terms of like the little bit of strands outside the, the form of the hair, I always, if I have the capability of doing so, I'll liquefy the surrounding area around the hair and push it in. And then I'll just mask off where the shape of the hair begins. So that's exactly what I did here. Then I removed some of the hair strands. I not only removed some of the hair strands, but I also copied this hair right here onto this gap right there. And then I removed even more distractions. I darkened this flare. I removed even more distractions. Now it's over here. I did a little bit of selective color, which actually in hindsight, after my edit, I feel like it's made it to a bit of a greenish tone. So I'm gonna just take it off. And then <laughs> I removed even more distractions. Then I did a little bit of dodge and burn to the dress because you can see a little bit of uh, the wrinkles in the, the chest area. So then I did a little bit of dodge and burn. I removed dress wrinkles. Yeah, right here towards the edges using I think like the patch tool. Then I added a little bit of gradient on the corner there. And then I did one last round of distraction removal. And then after that, I was finally done with the photo and I felt like it was good enough to post it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was a little bit long, but I hope all the things that I went over today were helpful to you. But now we're done and I'll see you guys in the very next video. Take care.